Okay, so this is the video for Lab 7, Titration of a Carbonated Beverage. This lab is pretty awesome because it ties in everything we've done so far. So here you're going to have uh, equations for dimensional analysis from Unit 1. You're going to have compounds and compound naming from Unit 2. And then really what we're focusing on here is the stoichiometry from Unit 3 and then the types of reactions from Unit 4. And it's really interesting because now we're going to be pulling those in to a specific reaction that is pretty applicable for most students. Um, almost everybody drinks soda, and in this lab you end up finding out how much acid is actually in soda in terms of molarity. Now keep in mind, um, even small numbers in terms of um, acids and bases can be relatively large in terms of uh, pH and affecting different parts of uh, a reaction. So just keep that in mind as you go through this lab this week. So what we're going to talk about in this video, we're just going to review briefly what it means to be a neutralization reaction, specifically what type of acid are we dealing with here, um, and what the reaction itself is going to look like. Then we're going to talk about the types of acids that you're going to see this week. And then I'm going to go through the lab in a little bit more detail than you'll probably have time in class for, um, including what the purpose of each section is, um, how we are going to uh, organize the lab, how you need to be prepared for each section, that kind of thing. We'll go over the equations that you're going to use what it means when we say KHP is a primary standard, and then we'll end with what actually we're talking about with a titration. So neutralization reactions you guys learn in Unit 4. You have an acid and a base, and they neutralize, neutralize each other to form water and some salt or ionic compound. Now, the big example here, you always see this in your text, is HCl plus NaOH forms water, and NaCl. It's a double displacement or a double replacement reaction where you have an acid and a base. Now, because we are not interested in strong acids here, instead what we're going to be using is a primary standard that is um, monoprotic, we're not going to be using HCl. It's going to be a different acid. Now you're still going to have water and some ionic compound, but for example, we could have, um, if we had a, uh, well, let's just talk about the one that's going to be in lab. So KHP, and I'm not going to write the real formula. If you look up potassium hydrogen phthalate, it's actually pretty uh, in depth. Plus NaOH is going to form water and a potassium uh, salt. Um, and so you're going to have the Na coming over here, and I guess the abbreviation would be something like this. Now, um, the organic component of this is actually pretty large. But the idea is if you have one acidic proton, you're going to neutralize that in a one-to-one -one ratio with NaOH to form water and some ionic compound. Now instead, if we had something that's triprotic, now, in this lab, you're going to be dealing with citric acid. But here, let's give you some other examples. Um, let's go with pen and something like that. So monoprotic acids are something like HCl. HCl plus NaOH gives NaCl and water. It's a one-to-one -one ratio because there's one H so this is monoprotic, one proton comes off, monoproton, and one hydroxide. If we had a diprotic, it would be something like H2SO4 plus 2NaOH to form Na2SO4 and H2O. Now, I'm already balancing this for you because I just want you to see, this puts off two acidic protons, so the ratio here is 1 to 2. Um, 
And that's really what we're talking about. When we say monoprotic, it means one acidic proton is going to come off. Diprotic mean, means there's two acidic protons that will come off. And triprotic means there's three. So here, an example that you would have seen in lecture would be something like phosphoric acid. If we had phosphoric acid reacting with NaOH, in order to balance this, Oops, I forgot my two up here. In order to balance this, we would have had to have a three here, three sodiums, three sodiums, and a three here. Now we have a one to three ratio. Um, now, the other reason I want to bring this up is because citric acid has a three to one, or three acidic protons that should come off. So there should be a three to one ratio here. And now, if we look at your, oops, and show, keep, if we look at your lab handout, and go all the way, citric acid is actually C6H8O7. All of these hydrogens are not acidic. The only three of them come off, so it's a triprotic acid. So if we were to write the formula for this one, I'm going to go ahead and put the acidic protons out here. So it's going to be H3C6H5O7. Um, H3C6H5O7. These are the acidic ones here. Plus 3NaOH to form three waters. And Na3C6H5O7. And I barely had enough room. Now, ideally, this is what you are going to confirm in lab. Hopefully, you will find that you needed three moles of NaOH every time you use one mole of citric acid. And so when we talk about the lab, you actually have several parts where you're going to find this first using the soda, and then you're going to confirm it using purified citric acid compound. OK, so this lab has several parts. In part A, you're just going to be making your solution. So you're going to have a stock solution that has already been prepared. It's usually at a very high concentration. I think the bottles that you're going to be using this uh, semester are something like 2.5 molar. And you're going to be using, in the lab, something much smaller, something like 0 0.04 molar. That's all you need. And so you're going to use a dilution to get from here, your stock, to what you actually want to use in the lab. So that's part A. Then for part B, we have to actually look at the, the real concentration of this NaOH. Because NaOH is hydroscopic, the concentration continually changes. Um, we could standardize this for you guys um, the Friday before labs, and by Monday morning, the pH would be, or the concentration would be different. Um, it's important to, type, to standardize your NaOH virtually every day. And so we don't really know that this is 2.5 molar. It could be 2.4 molar. It could be 2.31 molar. Who knows? Um, and so we have this rough estimate. You're going to try and make 0.04 molar NaOH. And then for part B, you're going to standardize it and find out exactly the concentration to um, uh, the right number of sig figs. Um, and I'm blanking at the moment as far as which balance you're supposed to use. So at least two, but preferably more like three sig figs. So it won't be one sig fig like here. You should have a little bit more detail. Then for part C, um, you're actually going to use the concentration of your NaOH to find the moles of um, acid that's in your Sprite. Now, you have to use the concentration that you find in Part B to, to calculate the acid that's in your Sprite. And what you should find, um, well, it, it, it should go pretty well. It, it worked really well. Um, last semester anyway. And then finally, what you're going to do is you're going to confirm 
that citric acid, I forgot to write this, is triprotic. And the way you're going to do that is you're going to take purified and solid citric acid and you're going to titrate it with your NaOH. So let's just talk about part A. So in part A you're going to be preparing your NaOH solution. Now if we go back to and show keep if we go back to well either way <gasps> Excuse me. If we go back to the procedure, we want to make <clears throat> about 200 mils of your NaOH. And when you make 200 mils, that's going to be more than enough to use for the entire lab. Oh, there we go. So you have this part in your data section where it says the concentration of the stock, this comes straight from the bottle, guys, and I think it's 2.5 molar. The volume of the stock used, volume after dilution, and your final concentration. Now, it says approximate because we don't really know that the concentration on the bottle is accurate because, remember, it's hydroscopic. So let's go back here for a second. Anytime you do a dilution, you have one solution, you're making it a little less concentrated, you're going to use M1V1 is equal to M2V2. The molarity times the volume is equal to the new molarity times the new volume. And so if you know we're going to be measuring in milliliters, you don't actually have to convert to liters. Even though molarity is moles per liter and moles per liter, if you use milliliters here, it doesn't cancel but what's going to happen is when you solve for this V by dividing both sides by this molarity, that goes away, these two cancel, you're going to be left with milliliters. And so don't get too bogged down in converting to, to liters. You don't have to here. Um, now let's look for a second. We know... we want to make 0. Point, actually what your procedure tells you, I forgot we did it this way this time, um, what your procedure tells you is to take 3.2 mils of your 2.5 molar and then you're going to dilute that to 200 milliliters in a volumetric flask. Now the volumetric flask looks kind of like this. So you're going to add your 3.2 milliliters of your NaOH and then you're going to fill with deionized water to the only line in this volumetric flask. Then you're going to cover this with parafilm or a stopper depending on what's in your bin and you're going to invert it a little bit, shake it around, make sure that it's nice and mixed. Um, you want to make sure that this is homogeneous all the way through or what's going to happen is the concentration down here wouldn't be the same as up here. Now guys, if you've never used parafilm before and that's what you have to use, um, it, parafilm is like uh, the chemist version of saran wrap. So what's going to happen is you're going to tighten it over the top and then you're going to put your thumb here and so that when you invert it, um, this is not going to just fall off. Imagine like using saran wrap on the top of a glass of water. It's not going to hold all the water in there, guys, okay? So make sure when you're shaking this around, you put your thumb here regardless of whether it's a stopper or the parafilm. Make sure it's secure. You don't want to get base all over you because that's bad. Now when you do this, you have the 2.5 molar and you've got roughly 3.2 milliliters. Make sure you're recording your volume here. Don't just say, oh yeah, we added 3.2 milliliters. Maybe you added 3.3 or 3.5. Use your volume. And then you dilute it up to 200. So solving for this, your M is going to be roughly 0.04 molar. That's an approximate number. 
it is not really what you have. Um, also keep in mind two sig figs, two sig figs, one sig fig, except this is exact. This has been calibrated. So because this is exact, you need at least two sig figs here. So this is really 4.0 times 10 to the minus 2 molar. It's still an approximate value, guys. So when you go um, forward, you have to find exactly what that is. And the way we're going to do it is with a primary standard. Now, KHP um, is a primary standard. It's a really commonly used one. Um, what a primary standard is, is it's going to be um, a high molar mass compound that is highly stable, that will, um, it's not going to degrade over time. It's got to be highly pure, and it's just going to react in a very predictable way. So here we know that KHP is a monoprotic acid and will react with NaOH in a one-to-one -one ratio. So here we know, for example, and I believe you get the balanced equation in your pre-lab. Um, let's just confirm that. Come on. There it goes. Keep. So if you go back through your pre-lab, pre There it is. KHP with NaOH is going to give um, water and a salt, basically. Um, really, your Na could be here, your Na could be here, but because it's a spectator, it's left off. doesn't really matter. The idea is it's one mole, one mole. Come on. There we go. So when we do this, Na... KP plus NaOH. Oops, I'm sorry. That was... No. I'm going to step ahead of myself. Um, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So when you add your, your two things together, you're going to be able to figure out what the concentration of NaOH is. Now, the way this works is you're going to have a flask. In that flask, you need to add some KHP, and you're going to get the exact grams of KHP. I think it's about 0 0.1 gram, but ask your instructor if you're not sure. Then you're going to add a couple drops of indicator, and you're going to add some water. Now, the problem is, if you get KHP along the wa walls of this, you're not going to really have it in the bottom reacting. So what you're going to do is you're going to spray water against the sides of your flask to make sure that you bring all of this KHP down to the bottom. When you do that, you'll know for sure exactly how much KHP is going to be reacting. You're going to know exactly how much um, you have. And the great thing here is you don't really care about the volume of water because water isn't going to be an issue. All you care about is making sure you have the grams of KHP down at the bottom of that flask. And then you'll need to shake it around a little bit, um, swirling gently so that you dissolve the KHP. Now guys, I will tell you the biggest thing that people mess up, and I tell you they do it every semester, do not forget this indicator. If you forget the indicator, there's no point. The indicator is what tells you you're done titrating. Okay. Then you have this burette. When you are titrating with your burette, make sure you've rinsed it a few times. Make sure you have your NaOH. Now, it starts down here at 50, and your zero is at the top. Do not, do not, okay, do not subtract your volume here. People always try to make this too hard where they're like, oh, it's sitting at the, you know, 4.2 milliliters, so it's really got 46. No, don't subtract, just read it exactly how it is. So you're going to have your initial volume. Usually it's something like 4.2 or 4.1.
and then you're going to go through and you're going to titrate until you see a nice pale pink color. Guys, the difference between pale pink and bright fuchsia is about one drop. So be slow. Go carefully. And maybe here you'll get something like 15.7 milliliters as your final, final volume. Um, also, by the way, guys, you're going to have an extra decimal placed, but I'm just making this up as I go. So 4.2. If I guess I wanted to do sig figs, I would have zero, zero. So 4.20, and your final volume is 15.70. That means it gives you a really nice way to subtract. And you can say 15.70 minus 4.20. You get something like 11.5 milliliters. OK. Um, now, the whole point of this is to find the molarity of NaOH. The way we're going to do that is we're going to start with the grams of KHP used. And we're going to go to moles NaOH. And then eventually we're going to get to molarity NaOH. So we can go from grams to moles using the molar mass, which is given in your pre-lab. Then we can get to moles of NaOH using that one-to-one -one ratio in the equation that's also given in your pre-lab. And then you're going to go from moles to molarity by dividing by liters, which you guys have up here. So you're going to convert this to liters, and then you're good to go. Remember that there is 1,000 milliliters every time you have one liter. So this is 0 0.01150 liters. At this point, you can plug it in and say, OK, well, for this example, I use 0.1 grams of KHP. There are 204.2 grams every time I have one mole of KHP. One mole of KHP, according to the equation, will react with one mole of NaOH. Oops, how on earth did that happen? At this point, we are in moles of NaOH. OK, so 0.1 times 1 times 1 divided by 204.2. That gives us 4.89 times 10 to the minus 4 moles. To go to molarity, we're just going to divide by the number of liters, which is 0 0.01150 liters, which will give us something like 0.04, uh, I'm going to go with 2.6 molar NaOH. So it's still really close to the molarity we were aiming for, but a little bit more specific, a little bit more um, accurate. So you're going to do um, two trials of this. Now be careful, because if you get a dark fuchsia endpoint, um, you will not do two trials. You'll have to do three. So make sure you're being very careful to go to that pale pink color for your endpoint, because if you're at a pale pink color, um, it means that your endpoint and your equivalence point are very, very close together. Um, if you go to that fuchsia, your endpoint is way past your equivalence point, and you're going to get a larger error. So this is um, B, calculating uh, calculating the concentration of that secondary standard or your NaOH. Then you're going to find the moles of acid in a sample of Sprite. So if you look. What's great about this, keep, go to your data section, the concentration you just calculated for NaOH comes down here and is actually put in this line. So you can't do part C until you've done part B because you need this concentration of your NaOH. Now, in your procedure, it tells you to use a volume of soda. I can tell you right now that if you ignore the step, 
about boiling it or heating it, you're going to have really bad results. So it tells you to take 20 mils of the soda and just to make sure you heat it for about 10 minutes. If you don't, you're going to already have um, carbon dioxide and other things dissolved. You need this gone. Um, now, you're only going to use about 3 mils of the soda. So don't, you know, worry about getting exactly 20. You're only going to use about, you know, at most half of that. Um, but make sure you use about 3 mils. So now go back, going back to this data section. You have roughly 3 mils. You've got your new concentration of soda. Now you're going to titrate this soda again with a burette using the initial and final volume. You'll find the volume you used. If you know the volume and the molarity, you can get to the moles. Then, if we know there's 3 NaOH for every 1 mole of citric acid, you can find the moles of citric acid in the soda. And then you can find the concentration. So let's go back and just show you what this math is going to look like, okay? Oops. Nope. So let's say, for example, we had 3 mils of our soda. And again, guys, it really doesn't matter if you get anywhere near that. But we're going to have 3 mils of our soda. And with our initial and final volume, I don't know. Um, let's say we used, let's go back to this, for example. Um, our final volume was 15.7. So here, our initial volume was 15.70 milliliters. And maybe our final volume was 28.25 milliliters, which will give us a change in NaOH. of 12.55 milliliters. Now also remember our concentration was 0.0426. And again, when you're doing this, you added roughly 3 mils of your soda plus your indicator plus water. Again, the water has twofold diff thing here. It's going to make sure that you don't have any soda up in the um, on the sides of the flask. And then the other thing it does is it makes it a little bit easier for you to see. If you just have one drop down here or a few drops down here, it's really difficult to kind of see the reaction happening. If you have a nice um, 15 to 25 mils down here, it makes it very easy to swirl, and it makes it really easy to see the color. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind as you're going through this. So you're going to titrate this until you see the pale pink color. And at this point, you can find the moles of H plus and the moles of citric acid in your Sprite. So let's just do this. So we know, for example, we are starting with this many milliliters. Well, we really can't do anything with milliliters. We have to go to liters of NaOH. So then we can get to moles of NaOH using our molarity from part B. Then you can get to the moles of citric acid. And then you can get to the molarity of citric acid in your Sprite. So let's just look at what this is going to look like, OK? So we have 12.55 milliliters. Oops, there we go. We'll just put it down here. And then there's 1,000 milliliters every time we have one liter. One liter of our solution, for our example on the last slide from part B, would be 0 0.0426 moles of NaOH. Now, according to your pre-lab, you should have three moles of NaOH every time you have one mole 
of citric acid. Because this citric acid has three acidic protons, it takes three NaOH to titrate it. So at this point, we can get the, um, the moles of citric acid. So we're going to say 12.55 divided by 1,000 um, divided by 3, and then don't forget to times by 0.0426. And you get something like 1.78 times 10 to the minus 4. But remember, you have to, this is just moles. You're going to end up dividing this by the liters of Sprite or the liters of soda that you're using. Converting this to liters gives 0 0.003 liters. So you come down here, divide those moles by your liters. And you get something like 0 0.059 molar citric acid and Sprite. Now this is a little bit higher than what you're probably going to see. Um, I hope. I hope you don't see it this high. Um, but still keep in mind that this is an incredible concentration. Um, that's really, really high. I think this is more like a lemon juice concentration instead of um, citric acid that uses lemon juice in it. Um, but you'll get some kind of small number. Make sure you're um, con considering whether it's truly small or whether it just seems small and still has a great impact. So just uh, be aware of what you might see. So that's what you're going to do for part C. Now. The other thing you're going to want to do is, in Part D, you're actually going to weigh out some grams of citric acid. And using the molar mass, you're going to go to moles of citric acid. And then you're also going to use some volume and molarity of NaOH. And you're going to find the moles of NaOH you use. Ideally, Part D will confirm that you use three of these every time you use one of these. Um, it's just a way of confirming that it's a triprotic acid that we're dealing with. Um, usually for you guys, it comes out pretty close, you know, um, keeping in mind that we do pretty cheap, pretty easy labs. You're not going to get right exact. It's probably going to be something like 2.95 or 2.85 um, or even 3.15. Who knows? Um, but that's the whole part point of Part D. So hopefully this kind of gives you an idea of what the math will look like. And show. Keep. Have fun with it, guys.